life of the Bay Area um, between air quality and pandemic and fire mm -hmm. smoke and all that. So thank you all for joining us and um, and being with us this morning. So um, as I mentioned, if you heard, uh, we're going to, you know, just uh, do introductions by way of the, the chat. And if you could just put the in your chat in the chat who you are and what your role is with uh, the district, that would be wonderful. And we can kind of get a clue of um, what's happening there. Uh, I want to acknowledge Bob Jacobson, who is um, oh, by virtue of just introductions, I'm past District Governor Chris Gallagher, and I'm the chair of the International Services Committee. And if anybody from the International Services Committee is on the on the, on the call, please wave to the screen. I know Bill is here and Pian and, and Keith and Steve and David. So thank you all for being here. Um, I do this on my iPad, so I have to scroll several screens to see everybody. <laughs> um, so um, I will do my best if, if uh, to, to acknowledge folks as they come. But I want to acknowledge Bob um, Jacobson, who is helping us with our uh, technical um, aspect of today. So uh, thank you, Bob, for being here and, and supporting us. And um, I think probably by now, we have all done enough Zoom calls to kind of know what the Zoom etiquette is, uh, which is um, keep yourself on mute until uh, which time, um, you know, we, it's okay to unmute you because out of respect to the speaker, um, you know, people's phones go off or their dogs bark in the background or whatever the case is. So uh, just keep yourself on mute and I'll kind of monitor the chat box uh, for questions and things like that um, for anything. So, um, you know, we just want to uh, sort of be respectful just like we were if we were in person. Um, this is being recorded. So, um, you know, as much fun as we have with each other all the time, I, <laughs> let's let's kind of refrain from making fun of each other, <laughs> even though we know it's a good fun. Uh, we just want to make sure we, we kind of keep a professional standpoint about that. Um, and let's see, Bob, anything else from a technical standpoint we should know? Uh, yes, you should all have fun today. That's the oh. most important thing. Perfect. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, and how many do we have so far, Bob? It looks like people are really joining in. So I'm showing great. 52. Perfect. At the okay. Well, I had a I had a bet with Bob that there would be 60 people. So hopefully we'll get eight more in the next few minutes. <laughs> um, so um, I'd like to start off with Kiki and I'll keep scrolling till I see Kiki's face. I know she's on here. Yes, you are Kiki, right? Hello. Hi, Hi Kiki. Hello. And, and Kiki is with Rotary International and uh, she will give us her official title and I, I had it on the email, uh, but Kiki works with her cohort, uh, Elena, um, from Rotary International in supporting um, international services committee chairs. Um, and I met, I, I've met Kiki uh, remotely. I haven't met her in person. We were supposed to meet in Denver last year, but she got a great opportunity to go somewhere much more exciting than Denver. Um, but it's been good to have that support. And um, I've invited her back each time we meet in case they're, you know, just so she hears what 5150 is doing. And I bragged big time to her yesterday about 5150. I see our district governor has just signed on, Mary Bates. Would you like to say anything before we start or do you want to wait till the end? Well, I'll say a little something here. Just I want to thank uh, past governor uh, Chris Gallagher for for having the inspiration to lead her team and for us to have these regular meetings. It is well needed and I just wanted Chris to know that you are greatly appreciated along with your committee. So thank you and let's carry on. All right. So Kiki, you're up. Thank Take it you. away. 
thank you all. I'll, I'll, I'll go on and pronounce my last name because everyone just calls me Kiki because <laughs> the last name might be a little intimidating. Um, I'm Kiki Milanidis and I'm a specialist uh, for, uh, for Rotary Service and Engagement. And Alina is our manager and she supports um, the entire, entire team's portfolio. Everyone can hear me, right? Okay. So I wanted to extend greetings to all of you on behalf of Rotary Service and Engagement Team and the entire staff from Rotary World Headquarters in Evanston. So I hope that when you think of World Headquarters, you think of individual staff there and we're working really to support Rotarians like you around the world. Um, I mean, we, well, we don't walk into the building anymore, but when we used to walk in the building, the first thing we thought of is, is what can we do to support the great Rotarians out there in the field? Um, we also want to let you know that we're thinking of you, especially during these difficult times and with the devastating fires in California, and we hope that you're all safe. Um, 2020 has indeed been a very challenging year, beginning with COVID, and staff at Rotary have been working since March, mid-March, uh, at home supporting uh, Rotarians. And I know we're all working uh, and living in a very different world and we're trying our best to navigate. And we've become, as a result, more flexible and creative for sure. Uh, we have marveled at, um, at Rotary how quickly you've been able to pivot to working virtually, initially shifting your work toward COVID related projects in your local communities. And that's just great. We've all become experts in Zoom meetings. I have a love hate relationship with um, Zoom but it really has been great. And I see it as one of the silver linings of social distancing, being able to continue working and doing the good work in the world. I was talking to Chris yesterday and she shared an example of good news during these, these challenging times. She shared how club members are continuing to pay their weekly meal stipend, even though you're not meeting in person. Instead, you're feeding seniors uh, dinner. And in this way, you're supporting <sighs> four local restaurants in dire financial states states to stay open. I mean, what a creative way that is to continue your good work. And this is one, just one example of many, I'm sure, uh, in your own cl uh, clubs, in your districts and districts around the world. And we thank you for your ingenuity and flexibility. So in my presentation today, I will introduce you to our Rotary Service and Engagement Team, my role to support District International Service Committee Chairs, DISCs as we call them, why international uh, service is so important and resources you can access to strengthen your, pro your projects. Next slide. Well, one more. Thank you. So here's a photo of our small yet mighty team. Um, they kill me if they knew I'm sharing this right now, but I did it anyway. Uh, we had just completed a team day of service. So our team has an extensive portfolio supporting activities and programs to help you make the most of your Rotary membership. So we support international service committee chairs, community service chairs, Rotary action groups, Rotary fellowships, Rotary friendship exchanges, Rotary community core, inter-country committees, project fairs, discussion groups, Rotary Shake Showcase, service partners, and open world. I'm sure I'm forgetting one or two. Um, I serve as the main contact for District International Service Chairs, like Chris from District 5150. I support efforts to increase uh, uh, clubs' participation in international projects, as well as to develop district resource networks of mentors with experience to help club members develop stronger projects and grants. Next slide. So I'd like to highlight how the important role of DISCs um, is and the importance of district resource networks. And it's the framework that supports clubs and district involvement in international service. But before we dive into specifics, I'd like to show how uh, this support aligns with servi our service and engagement portfolio. As mentioned, our team within programs and grants, service and engagement, supports activities and programs and resources to help our members build fellowship and connect uh, to service projects. We support three avenues of service, 
And many of you who have been at Rotary for a while remember the avenues of service, community, international, the three that we support, and vocational. Through our programs such as Rotary Action Groups, Fellowships, and Exchanges, and two of the types of partnerships, service and project partners, and resources such as project fairs. So international service is an overarching priority for our organization. Um, districts can, and clubs can be involved in small, medium, or really large scale activities, either as a host or an international partner, funded through your own fundraising efforts and partnerships, or through the foundation if the project meets eligibility for a district and global grant. So the uh, International Service Committee um, has existed for a long time. It's not a new committee. And it's really about supporting clubs and clubs engagement in uh, projects. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So here I'll focus on kind of the new uh, updated role in 2016 there was a strategy that was approved for involving our experienced members in mentoring clubs and projects and grants. And the boards updated the role of the DIS. So in addition to encouraging international service activities, um, they are tasked with building a network of mentors to help develop stronger projects. As of the 5th of September, we have 350 DISCs. Um, reported for Rotary year 2020-21. Okay, next slide. So I mentioned uh, district resource networks and it sounds um, perhaps complicated, but it's really something I think that you already do. You tap into the expertise of your own members in your own clubs and we describe it as building your own consulting firm. But rather than spending millions of dollars, dollars to hire consultants, we get this free help from our own members who have the technical skills and experience and can mentor clubs. So the district resource network can consist of local Rotarians, as you can see depicted here in the slide, Rotary alumni with experience or technical skills, and the mentors can be uh, Rotary Action Group members, cadre members, uh, members of vocational Rotary fellowships, alumni, uh, members of the Rotary representative network, non-Rotarians, community members, and much, much more. So at this point, I'll go over some of uh, our resources that can help you engage in international activities and specific, specifically help you improve projects. And I'll go into Rotary action groups Rotary Fellowships, Rotary Friendship Exchange, and Project Fairs. Okay, next slide. So I think many of you are familiar with Rotary Action Groups. They're independent, internationally organized Rotary affiliated groups, and their members have experience in a specific concentration. And they can use this expertise to help clubs and districts plan and implement large scale projects. Okay, next slide. So as of October 2019, um, there are 25 RI recognized Rotary Action Groups. And each of them, as you can see the ones that are depicted on the slide here, has a unique expertise in a particular service area, such as peace, water, sanitation, Alzheimer's, microfinance, health education, disaster assistance, and more. So the list is, uh, we separate it by area of focus. And if you wanna know more, or if you wanna join our Rotary Action Group, um, there is our website. And what I could do also at the end, well, I can send you uh, links as resources so you can have them after this presentation. <laughs> so the next resource I'd like, oh, next slide. The next resource I'd like to draw your attention to are Rotary Fellowships. They're international, independently organized groups of interested indivi individuals who share a common hobby, a recreation, an interest, or a profession. And Gee, it's that's a 5150 uh, Rotarian, Chris Major. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I yeah. knew that. I knew that. 
<laughs> but thank you for throwing that in there for us. Yeah, I thought I wondered if someone would catch that. Um, well, great. That's a, I'd like to uh, meet him one day. Okay, next uh, next slide. Here's just a small sampling of Rotary fellowships: skiing, yachting, international fellowship of Rotarian musicians. International Fellowship of Rot Rotarian Doctors and Health Professionals, Antique Automobiles Fellowship. I know there's like one for motorcycle enthusiasts. I know there's one for har hard rock enthusiasts. I think the list just goes on. So again, I have the link here if you're interested in find about finding more. And what we have found, like through, even through like a fellowship, well, I'll go next to the Friendship Exchange and I'll make a note. Um, next slide, please. So another great resource is the Rotary Friendship Exchange, another international program for members and friends, which means anyone, um, a friend of yours could join, anyone can join, allowing participants to, make, to take turns hosting one another in their homes and clubs. So it allows you, uh, Rotarians and non-Rotarians, to experience different cultures, uh, explore professions, build long-standing relationships. Okay, next slide. So there's three types of exchanges, uh, cultural exchange, uh, where you're really learning about each other's uh, eth ethnicity, food, language, history, and more. Uh, service exchanges, just opportunities for hands-on projects. Vocational exchanges, where you're exploring specific professions. So what I've, I've talked about uh, Rotarian action groups and Rotary fellowships and Rotary friendship, friendship exchanges. And all three of these groups can really lead to long-term relationships with, between two partnering districts and clubs or even just from club to club. And this is a great opportunity to find partners for global grants or even just participate on further exchanges. Okay, uh, next slide. So another great resource um, are project fairs. And they're a great way for, um, for some members from District 5150 to actually go and attend them in person and actually find uh, the hosts of a partner and get to know them and partner, be, be the international uh, partner. So any club representative or Rotary member who's interested in supporting an international service project can attend. You could use district grants to support travel. Well, I'm talking about a pre-COVID world. Uh, be used to support travel to and participate in, pro in project fairs it, or DDF. Okay, next slide. So I'm excited to share that given um, the world that we're living now and traveling is really no longer an option for the time being, we are piloting virtual project fairs, and we have two. Uh, the first one's happening in Ecuador, 13th through the 19th of November. And at this point, you all can attend. It's not going to cost you anything. I think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for you to find out more about the projects that um, need partners. Uh, the next one we also have is in West Africa. I think more details will be coming. And I think um, this is a really great way to build relationships. And um, you know, I think it's hard when you're looking for a, a partner if you don't know somebody, but this could be kind of the first step in making this relationship. So I'm also giving you a link where you can find out more information on project fairs um, and how you can uh, join. Okay, next slide. So, um, I ask, I, I, I ask for your support at this point, and I thank you for all your good work and ask you to share information on international service and the district resource network uh, with all your clubs. And we urge you to continue working with uh, Chris Gallagher, your mighty disc, uh, and utilize all the project resources, the ones I've highlighted and so many more that we have. Continue supporting efforts to develop District 5150's resource network by sharing your own exper experience and technical skills. And tell us about your project success. Um, and we'll, you know, we're happy to promote success stories in our Rotary Service blog. We have someone on our staff who's responsible for cultivating stories and developing stories with 
with content providers and we're able to promote it. And I also uh, share details quarterly with DISCs worldwide. So I'm happy to include an update there as well. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. We're in the process of completing an online uh, DISC course, which will be available to everyone. And I can let Chris know and she can share um, information on that. And I hope that she would also share the update that we send quarterly with you. And um, I wanna end my remarks by saying that the work of the, uh, at the District International Service Chair is really designed to allow clubs and club members like you to really be able to do the, do, do the good work that you do. It's all about engaging you in activities and that's exactly what we do at Rotary International. So I thank you for your efforts and I hope to really join you monthly in these calls that Chris has been great to put together. So thank you. Unmute. I have to unmute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kiki, for all of that information. And um, past district governor, Holly Axtell, would be so proud because I was timing and she came under 15 minutes, Holly. So you should be really proud of that. We, we, we pride ourselves on keeping on time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, that's uh, Holly was my mentor before I took over this position three years ago. So, um, and we've stuck to that, but um, thank you so much. There's a lot of information that Kiki shared with us this morning and I've asked her to, I'm going to make sure she's always invited to these calls, but if anything sparked an interest with any of you, um, whether it was the fellowships or whatever it is, um, send those ideas to me because Kiki is more than willing to get um, individuals within Rotary International to speak to us and um, tell us more about whatever it is you want to know. So, um, you know, we have a great resource there and I think it's, you know, it's wise of us to use it to our advantage. So if we want to know more on an area of service or if we want to know something on uh, whatever yacht. Uh, well, we have Alan Testa tell us about yachting, but we could have somebody from the Brew uh, Fellowship come and talk. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Irwin, who is with the Rotary Club of San Francisco Evening. And, and as you all know, there's a new area of service um, or area of focus uh, that Rotary just adopted which is um, the environment. And Karen wanted to show some, um, share some ideas about um, how we could start implementing that or, or taking part in that. And Kiki, I hope you stay with us for the whole meeting um, just to kind of get an idea of what we talk about. So Karen, I'm gonna let you take it from there. Hi, thank you so much, Chris. Can you hear me? I, Chris, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. I hope everybody okay. else can. Okay, great. I'm just checking. Uh, can everyone see my screen? I just shared some slides. Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for this opportunity to talk about an idea um, for District 5150 that supports um, Rotary International's new area of focus, which is supporting the environment. And I know we're all kind of under this COVID restriction time and it's really kind of put a damper on our ability to do group projects for community service. So this idea is really for a home-based initiative and that would be around planting pollinator friendly gardens, um, whether it's in someone's front yard, backyard or a planter box, if you don't have a yard. And uh, you know, it seemed just like a no better, no better time than now to, to start something like this. And why is this important? So you may have seen some statistics on pollinators and how important they are. They uh, pollinate a third of our food supply, whether it's oh, beef, or one minute. It's really not or other, other uh, insects. And uh, they are under significant decline due to habitat loss, uh, pesticide overuse, um, diseases from imported species, climate change, and the list just kind of goes on. It adds up and um, the, the pollinator species are really suffering. So urban pollinator gardens um, can bring back this habitat. And my understanding is even a small backyard garden can actually make uh, quite a difference. And I think this, this really can be considered uh, a service to the community to plant these kinds of gardens. 
So there are many resources available. Here are just a few. Uh, the Xerxes Society is, is a prominent uh, nonprofit organization that really does a lot of work in pollinator habitat. There's the Nature Conservancy, the US uh, Forest Service, um, a lot of universities offer informational resources. So there's no lack of informational resources. There's no lack of uh, initiatives around pollinators. Um, and so I really think that, you know, if our, if our district wanted uh, some uh, Zoom calls with pollinator experts from various organizations, that it would actually be pretty straightforward and easy to that support. But I think what would be unique about a Rotary initiative uh, compared to some of the other nonprofit initiatives is that they're appealing to, you know, generically more broadly to homeowners. And we have this wonderful, um, you know, and membership engagement. We are all committed to, you know, community service and um, we can inspire others to action and we're all well connected. So um, I think that would uh, enable this kind of initiative to really, to really move forward. And the practices that are used to plant and uh, maintain a pollinator friendly garden are actually um, offering benefits towards the larger uh, context of restoring ecosystem services, whether it's uh, planting compost and, and using compost and mulch in your soil, or uh, avoiding pesticides, or um, planting native species that bring back habitat and, and don't require a lot of water in a drought condition. So, um, you know, we've really all kind of inherited these somewhat compromised landscapes that are developed, and this is an opportunity to restore those landscapes to, um, to uh, enable more natural abundance instead of declines that we're currently experiencing. And they can also go hand in hand if we have members that already are interested in planting a food garden or an herb garden. Uh, the pollinator friendly garden, whether it's large or small, can, can go uh, to be part of that. And this could also be turned into a challenge or a competition, you know, something to make it fun for our members. And so for me, it's really about uh, inspiring, rethinking the value of our landscaping, inspiring a new norm. And my understanding is that homeowners and communities are more influenced by a neighbor, a respected neighbor that goes out and, and builds something completely different as an eco-friendly yard. They're more likely to follow that example than they are to really just listen to a, a overall outreach or media campaign. So um, definitely doing this in your front or backyard can make a big difference. And my hope is that if we were to uh, start this initiative in our district, that we could get other districts to uh, follow suit. So I, I, I pretty much that's all I had to offer today. And I'd be happy to take any thoughts or comments you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And, and I think, um, you know, we've seen a, in, an uptick in victory gardens uh, during the pandemic. A lot of people doing that and raising their own food and, um, just feeling like there's something, you know, getting your hands in the garden and doing that is really therapeutic in a lot of ways. Um, I know last year I did a, a native plant garden where I work at the Bay Model and work really closely with the California Native Plant Society and they were thrilled. And in fact, my garden is doing better than most of theirs. So um, I think they like it down near the water and they get just enough temperature. So and moisture to make it really, um, they're very happy. But people come by and take pictures and look at the hummingbirds and the bees and all that. So this is great. And, and to your point, you don't have to leave home. You could just do something on your porch or on your deck or something that would inspire those kinds of things. And it's a great teaching opportunity if you're having kids at home that you have to educate as well during this pandemic. So. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, um, and thank you for catching us up on time a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Feel free to reach out, you know, if you need uh, anything else from me. And yeah. Okay. So, so if anybody's inspired by Karen and wants her <laughs> info, I, I do have Karen's email and I can let you know what that is. So, that's great. Um, and if you have a question for her right now, just put it in the chat, just directly for Karen, and I'm sure she could answer it for you. So next we have our crack uh, expert district grants team that wants to give you a little update um, and primer for their training that they're gonna be doing later this year. And that team consists of Keith Axtell and from Marin Evening and Steve Wright 
from Pacifica and David Hellman from Mission San Rafael. So I did not, I'm not in charge of that group in the sense that they're, they're going to do it on their own. They're going to take it away from this point forward. Bob, I need to share a screen and I'll bring up the PowerPoint. This is Steve. You should be able to share, Steve. And David Hellman will start our presentation. Dave is the chair of the District Grants Committee. Okay, well, thank you all for being part of our audience. Um, I'm the chair, as Keith said, of the district of the grants committee for our district. Um, Keith is chair of our cadre of experts um, in the district that you work with to uh, get some advice on global grants. And Steve is our global grants coordinator for the grants committee. So we could have the next screen, please. Next slide. Steve, can you put it on slideshow? Just from current slide. Yeah. That'll expand the screen. There you go. Thank you. Okay. What we are talking about when we we're talking about using funds from the Rotary Foundation or what called district designated funds. These funds come from contributions that our individual members and clubs and others make to the annual fund share at the Rotary Foundation. Um, they stay there for three years, they're invested. Uh, those investments help cover the costs of the staff. And then three years later, half of it is returned to the district as district designated funds. Um, and if you do a global grant, actually the other 50% is also returned. So you end up getting 100% back um, because of the contribution of matching the DDF on global grants. So what we do as a district is somewhat unique um, in the Rotary world in that we allow the clubs to make the decision individually on how they want to use their district designated funds. Um, we allocate them to the clubs based on their contributions by club to the Rotary Foundation annual fund share over the past three years. And that then creates a percentage for their clubs, that club share compared to the total for the district. That percentage is multiplied by the DDF available. And then each club has that amount to spend and they spend it in one of uh, three ways. One is um, the president elects usually, and they have for the past several years, um, taken a proportionate part of their DDF to use to support a global grant scholarship. So that comes off of the club's DDF. Um, it's also used for district grants. Um, it can be allocated to Polio Plus. It can be allocated to the Rotary Peace Centers. It also can be allocated to various endowments or special projects um, that are allowed. Um, we do have a transfer form that the clubs are using to allocate that DDF. That uh, form needs to get to me and it has to be to me by March 1st of the Rotary year so that we can allocate the funds to this particular global grant. Now you also have the opportunity to use it for district grants. Those actually you apply for before the beginning of the Rotary year. So for this current Rotary year, you had to have applied by May 1st, or excuse me, June 1st um, to Cindy Sims, who is the district grants coordinator. And you'll be, and have been noticed uh, recently of how those have been approved. Um, we are limited on district grants to 50% of the DDF allocated to our district. And this past year, we, this current year, we actually have exceeded that amount. So I had to make an allocation going back on uh, 
to reduce the grants for those that requested more than 50% of their DDF to make that work. So these transfer forms that I briefly mentioned are used to allocate the DDF to their own, a, your own club's project, another club's or district's project for Polio Plus, Rolls Repeat Centers or one of those other projects. We move on to the next screen and I think, um, Keith, are you on starting here? I'm starting here, Dave. Do you, do you want to uh, mention just briefly for the new people how the decisions are made on what each Rotary Club gets in its allocation of DDF? Well, it is a percentage. It's based actually on what your club contributed. So we take the average of the prior three years of your contributions to the annual fund and take that number and compare it to the total for the district. And that percentage is what's multiplied by the DDF. And that's what's allocated to your club. So it's transparent. Your club makes the decisions. And that's what our purpose is. And uh, our experience has been since we've been doing this and giving the clubs that uh, ability, we've been able to raise more funds for Rotary to the annual fund share. And that has given us as a district greater EDF to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let me tell you, uh, I'll give you an overview of the Global Grant Program. It's uh, an outstanding opportunity that's being provided through the Rotary Foundation for us to do some really significant uh, international service work in a variety of areas. Uh, we can do uh, humanitarian type projects such as health, uh, health education, uh, economic development uh, projects through global grants. We can do peace building projects to address issues uh, creating conflict and war in countries. Uh, Dave mentioned the global scholarships. These are graduate level uh, scholarships to train and provide more expertise in Rotary's particular areas of interest areas of service, the areas of focus that uh, Steve will be telling us more about a little later, and also vocational training teams, ascending professionals to other countries to help with capacity building and conducting service projects in those countries. Next slide, please, Steve. The Global Grants is kind of a unique approach. It's a partnership between two Rotary Clubs in two different countries. Uh, one where the project will be carried out and then the other is the international partner, which our clubs are in, in basically in most cases. Uh, the correct model for a, a, a global grant is for the project to originate in the host country where the project will be carried out, that it will be identified by uh, that club, and then we will locate it through a project fair, other international contacts we might have, uh, international conferences, uh, prior work your club has done in that area uh, to support the work of the local Rotary Club. It's their community service project. When, when our clubs have thought up projects and taken them and try to sell them to other countries and other clubs, they haven't worked out too well because the ownership really isn't with that local club. We've had some major problems with those kind of projects. So please look for projects that the uh, local clubs want to do and support them. And I'd really encourage you to take part in the Ecuador Project Fair uh, coming up in November. They've got some outstanding Rotarians and uh, have done some incredible work in that country already, but the needs are still huge. So I uh, highly recommend that. Both clubs need to qualify to manage Rotary Foundation funds. Tell you more about that in a moment. Uh, Rotary has uh, gonna narrow down the range of activities that we can support through the six areas of focus, such as uh, literacy, education, health, uh, economic development, but they're still quite broad and there's plenty of work to do in those areas. They've recently started requiring a community assessment. And the purpose of this is to assure that the work we're gonna be doing to help the community is in line with the needs, but more, more importantly, the interests of that community. 
that they will actually support the improvements, uh, they will actively engage in helping implement them and then helping conduct them and carry them out uh, and, uh, and maintain them after we leave town. And the purpose of that is for sustainability of these projects. Uh, we, for example, uh, well-meaning charitable organizations have built uh, thousands of water systems around the world in many years, but only about half of them are still in operation. And that's because they weren't planned properly or they were put in some place where there was not local support and understanding. So in all of our projects now, we go to create work to be sure that there's a local commitment to maintaining the project and the skills building happens. Training is provided so that the uh, uh, people who are going to carry on the project know what to do, know how to do it, and have the resources to do it. Next, please, Steve. Uh, clubs need to qualify for, uh, as I mentioned, for uh, uh, obtaining Rotary Foundation funding. Uh, next slide. And uh, to do that, I'm sorry, I'm off track. Uh, global grants, uh, <laughs> there we are. Thank you, Steve. Uh, to qualify for managing a Rotary Foundation project, either a global grant or a district grant, the club must qualify through sending their president-elect to district training. Our district requires the district uh, elect and the district nominee or a committee chair of a foundation-related program to attend district training, district MOU training. And then the uh, club president and nominee sign a memorandum of understanding that uh, really lays out the agreement on what that club will do in administering Rotary Foundation funds. And it's important to note that both uh, clubs must meet these requirements. Uh, I've hit problems in the past with starting to work on a project with another club and then, uh, uh, and then uh, that club not having been qualified. Could you go back to the uh, grants amounts slides, Steve? I'm sorry I threw you off there. There we go. Uh, the uh, foundation uh, limits their grant amounts to between $15,000 and $400,000. Uh, and they only provide funds on a matching basis with funds that we raise uh, through our contributions from our clubs and the, uh, they're now matching, only matching DDF that Dave talked about earlier. They're no longer matching cash contributions. You can uh, include cash in your global grant project, but the foundation only matches the DDF. So in order to qualify for a global grant project, you have to raise $15,000 in DDF. That provides the match of $15,000, and then you'd have the minimum size project of $30,000. Uh, and then it can go up from there, depending on how much DDF uh, uh, you can raise from our district, our clubs, other clubs, other districts. Uh, it's wide open on where the funding can come from for these global grant projects. Okay, then drop on down to the uh, couple slides. Here we are. The application for the global grant is online and uh, it's at the Rotary Grant Center and the reports are done online as well. But key concepts are that our global grant projects relate to Rotary's mission. They're within the areas of focus and are specifically focused even within those areas on target areas that Rotary wants to impact. They are uh, projects that are carried out actively by Rotarians. Uh, this is not a program where you can simply raise money and then turn it over to some other uh, nonprofit organization or some other company uh, to carry out its program. They want to see Rotarians actively involved in carrying it out, managing the project, managing the funds. Mentioned before, we want the community to identify the needs to be certain it's really on target in helping make the maximum improvements 
to move that community forward. And we want to improve the capacity of the community so that they can uh, do a better job in the future of addressing their own problems through that the uh, capacity building that's been accomplished. Okay, now uh, uh, when we wrap up, I'd be happy to answer any questions. In fact, let me, let me take any questions that you have now. So why don't people write in the chat box if they have something, and then I can pose that to Keith and um, when they finish the whole presentation. Because okay. I, I don't want everybody to unmute at one time. So let's just keep going. Okay, we're, that would be we're, great. We're good on time. We're good on time. Okay. Uh, uh, just uh, wrap up. We're going to get into kind of introducing our team, but I wanted to mention that we have the uh, uh, our we have a district technical resource network that uh, Kiki mentioned earlier. Uh, there are five or six of us, uh, and I think we're pretty well all, all on the line. So uh, Steve Wright is uh, one of the key members of that and has helped several clubs with Global Grant Project. Rick Chin is our specialist in water uh, system. Uh, Rick, say hello to everybody. Uh, good morning to everybody. <laughs> all right. Be well. <laughs> And Bob, Bob Roberts, the uh, International Service Chair and past president of the Mill Valley Club is uh, another person available to assist clubs with global grant projects. Bob? Muy buenos dias. Yes, hello everybody. <laughs> and we have a brand new member reflecting our new environmental area of focus. Uh, Steve Crooks is a 30 year professional in the field of environmental management and sustainability and uh, uh, we look forward to working with Steve. He's got some great resources around the world for clubs that are interested in doing environmental projects. Uh, Steve, would you say hello? Uh, good morning, folks. Nice to meet you all. Steve is in the Marin Sunrise Rotary Club. And I want to thank Barbara Light for introducing him to us and being willing, him just being willing to join our team. Okay, thank you. So Keith, we have a couple questions. One is, are global grants and DDF usable for environmental causes? Uh, not, well, they are to some degree this year within the area of focus of the environment. Or if they can be hooked into one of the other areas of focus. Uh, the Rotary Foundation staff are basically doing the planning this year for that new area of focus. And next year, uh, they will be opening it up and starting global grants for environmental projects. So I'd say uh, we can work with you on trying to make it work this year, or you can certainly start planning one for next year. Okay. Uh, another question, how many global grants are we supporting now in District 5150? Dave, do you have any uh, general idea how many uh, global grants we might have? There must be, uh, you know, 10 or so active at this point and probably 20 or 25 that we've sponsored, I would think. Right, there, there are about 10 active ones that I can recall. Um, there are several in draft status at the foundation uh, where the clubs are still working on finishing them and raising the necessary funds to complete them. And uh, we're getting new ideas regularly. Um, and we do encourage people to let us know in advance when, you're, when you start a grant, you should notify me so that we can publicize it for you to help raise funds and also to put it on our district website. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. And then Susan from the Rotary Club of San Francisco has a question about, first of all, thanking you all for your past help. And will grants be rolled over until we could travel again? Um, yes, they're, um, once they're submitted and approved by the foundation, um, they're there and there are reporting requirements um, and you have to make an annual report on the anniversary of the approval of the grant, but if you're unable to do it, then um, that's the report and you move forward when you can. 
the right now have a Alliance for Smiles project that's supposed to go into Central America and they can't do anything because of COVID-19, so it's on hold. Okay. Uh, Sarah Nee from Belmont Club, if I remember correctly, uh, she would like to know where she can get information about district future projects. Where can she find out about them? That might be a Steve Wright question. Correct. And the answer to that one is simply, once we know about a project, we try and get it up on the website as fast as we can. So we will have it on our district website once we are told about the project from the club, and we keep that process as simplified as possible. Is that question about an international service project or a local district project in the, uh, in the community? She does not, Sarah, Sarah, international, she just answered. Ah, okay. Yes, well, yes, uh, we've, uh, uh, Steve has uh, arranged to put projects on the website uh, with the cooperation of Rotary Clubs that are sponsoring the projects, but also one role, one, one of the major roles of the International Service Committee is to uh, help clubs publicize their uh, future projects, whether global grant projects, or other projects where they're looking for support from other Rotary Clubs. And we do that by uh, inviting clubs to meetings such as this to uh, share their projects uh, briefly, to advise other clubs, and also circulate information to the international service chairs about what projects are looking for assistance. Partners. Okay. Um... So uh, the, I assume this is kind of a Bob Jacobson question. Um, since this is being recorded, then um, this Steve, I mean, uh, Keith's presentation and David's will be part of that, correct? Uh, it'll be saved on that recording because some yeah, you'll, people you'll, are, are you'll be able to go back to the recording. You'll be able to back go, go to the recording and take a look at it. Um, it might be easier though if we could actually just distribute copies of the presentation, right? That might be simpler too. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. So if you um, if you could send that to me, Keith, and then I'll send that out to everybody. Along, several people wanted Karen's information, um, uh, contact information. If Karen, if you want to put that in the chat box now for folks, and then I can also. Oh, she did. She did it already. Um, and then I can send it out to, um, I can send it out to everybody as well. So you can get it in two ways. Um, Certainly. Um, let's see. Um, John, Kauf, uh, John Kaufman, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question so that I don't screw this up. I want to make sure I'm articulating it correctly, but I think it'd be better if you did it yourself. You bet. Um, COVID's got us upended a bit. We have a project that we wanted to execute in July of 2021 in Uganda, about a $60,000 project. We would need to be expending money in April or May in advance of that. We have not filed the global grant with the Rotary Club of Kampala yet. Um, if, we, if we go after DDF funds by March 1st, 2021, as Dave indicated, we're kind of out of luck for funding this particular project, correct? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, because if you're using this year's DDF, the 2021 DDF, then once that rotary application once the application goes into the rotary foundation and it's approved then you can use it whenever the project can be done so the issue would be get it in as soon as you can get it approved you know but you're going to want to line up as much ddf now from the different uh, clubs in our district and other districts uh, for the project and then you can move forward and hopefully by july but what what when would funding start? In other words, we, we're submitting Mar by March 1st. Well, you're only telling me by March 1st that you're gonna use the DDF for that grant, but it's based on application approval by the Rotary Foundation. And once it's approved, 
they will start releasing the funds for the project. So then whenever the project's ready to go, you can use those funds. And the timetable submitting to you by March 1st. Um, uh, no, if I could clarify, John, you can submit your application to the Rotary Foundation anytime you want to. Ah, okay. Yeah. So as soon as you get enough funding, you can send it in in October or November. Uh, the, the March 1st deadline is on the Rotary Clubs using their DDF. Right. On, uh, on March 2nd, the district recaptures all the remaining DDF that's not been uh, used by the Rotary Clubs. I got it. Thank you. So that's not on the process. So you're in good shape. Okay. And we have, Steve is going to go ahead with some more of our presentation. We can... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Steve, go ahead. And we'll make this very rapid because this is just the overview for now. Uh, we have global grants that we're talking about that can be a vocational training team such as Alliance for Smiles. We also do global scholarship. We talk about it briefly. And that one every year for the past several years, all of the president elects have been asked at a president elect session if they want their clubs to participate. Through that for the last several years, we have donated 17,500. That's been matched by the foundation. So we've had a global scholar. Both of the top two can be tied into a humanitarian project. There's your global grants. And on the scholarships, their graduate level, one four years, they have to be aligned with one of the areas of focus and like every global grant, you need a host and an international sponsor. Key point here, there's a little bit of confusion. We keep talking about the six areas of service and vocational training teams, capacity building. All of these are pretty simple. Now, we keep talking about the areas of focus, six areas and a new area of focus for now through June 30th of 2021. We have six areas of focus. Starting July 1st of 2021, we add supporting the environment and the environmental sustainability Rotary Action Group that came up earlier. Here's the seventh area of focus. Now, every one of these area of focuses has behind it the area of focus policy statement. These are statements, they are guidelines, they're directives, if you will. And this is what Keith mentioned, the foundation, TRF, the Rotary Foundation, is currently building out the policy statements for the environmental sustainability area of focus. If you're gonna do a global grant, get very familiar with these because these are guideposts, signposts, and call them requirements. There's some pages, six areas of focus, two to three pages per area of focus. Here's just some quick ideas about various areas of focus, projects, and successful. And it's been mentioned in the past that the project should start locally in the host country where the project is going to be. We've mentioned the project fairs. We've mentioned Rotary Action Groups. You also have returning Peace Corps volunteers that have tremendous ideas to help the countries where they serve, Bob Roberts is a key one right there, Steve Carlson out of San Carlos. And there is also the Rotary Showcase where you can see what other clubs are looking for and what other host clubs need from the international clubs. And with that, that's right on time. I'm done. <laughs> Holly Axtell, your, your legacy continues. Um, so this is the uh, assistance group that we've mentioned throughout. Yeah. Uh, here are all our names. And uh, if you get a hold of me, I'll get you a person if needed. OK, so I let's I would like to put in one other plug real quick, if I could, Chris. And that is to uh, Shira Zach out of the Foster City Club. She asked me a couple of years ago, where do I find all, all of our club's projects on our website? I can't find them. So my thanks to Shiraz. She's the one suggested, rather logically, that we get our projects, our global grant projects, on the website. And just wanted to give the credit. Okay. So here's a, a last minute question from Mary Lou Griffin from Rotary Club of Foster City. Hi, if we have grants that have been approved and we cannot start the project during the fiscal year because of COVID, does the district recapture the DDF? No. 
Um, no, we do not. Um, once it's been approved and it's been allocated, then it stays there until, unless the project never comes to fruition, then it's allocated back to the clubs. But once it's approved, um, it stays there with the project and it does not have to be spent in the current year. Most global grants run more than one year in any event. They run two, two three years, sometimes longer. So that's uh, what's needed. It just needs to be committed. And then once the project's go going, uh, it gets used. Okay. And then uh, Steve Barber from Marin Sunrise is asking, what is the website to see all those projects? I assume it's the district website, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, I want to thank, um, we are 1201, so this is perfect and respect everybody's time. Uh, thank you all to the speakers. This was our first one out of the gate and I actually think it went very well. <laughs> and I hope it was time well spent. We are planning uh, to do um, something once a month with the International Services Committee. And we're gonna alternate our meetings um, this month it's a Saturday in October. Our next date will be October 14th, which is a Wednesday evening. So we're hoping that, you know, we'll appeal to some people if a Wednesday, if a weekday works better as opposed to a weekend. But in each case, the, the sessions will be recorded and um, you can watch them again um, at your leisure. And I wanna thank Bob Jacobson again for, for helping with this. And um, again, if you have ideas or suggestions, um, let me know for topics. Um, like I said, we have a whole month, a uh, whole year to fill <laughs> with meetings and we have a great resource with Kiki at RI who can help us get various speakers. And that's, you know, I would say that's kind of the silver lining in this COVID situation is that you know, we can bring in people from around the world and from RI uh, to join us on this and um, that we probably wouldn't have access to normally or it would be more difficult. So thank you so much. And um, did our district governor sign off yet? She I am still here, okay. Chair Chris. District yes. Governor Mary, do you want to send us off with some in oh, my. inspirational uh, with accolades? <laughs> uh, what can I say? That's uh, okay. I mean, it's beyond my dreams, and I love international service. I grew up uh, traveling the world because I was on the coattails of uh, a naval officer, my father, and. So I really deeply appreciate all of your efforts and your sharing of this knowledge to get us so that we can continue this. Once the floodgates are open, watch out world. <laughs> we will be <laughs> out there. But, but thank you, Chris, for leading this charge and to your team. And uh, I'm excited to be just a small part to be able to attend and enjoy. So thank you. All right. Well, everybody have a great Saturday. Rest of the day, stay safe. Don't don't go outside. <laughs> Stay <laughs> in. Go outside. <laughs> okay. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone. All right. Thank you.